welcome. Um, Brett asked me to uh, introduce Klaus Molyneux. Um, in, uh, in the context of design, I think that uh, architects and engineers are probably the ones who do not have a, the, the luxury of design and development the way it's understood in industry. That is to say, the Golf GTI that you buy has had many Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. right? And the one you buy is something that has actually been, you know, developed, even if it is the first of the series or whatever. The architect, the engineer, Mark 1 is a project that they did uh, when they finished in the school. Uh, Mark 2 is, uh, you know, flat for the mother-in-law. Mark 3 is a competition for uh, uh, housing. And then uh, perhaps Mark 4 is a petrol station. So where is the design development? Well, the design development is here in the Perth, right? Now, um, what happens then is that um, that design development that you carry with you, that culture, is the one that I think, in the case of Klaus, is very clear that he actually identifies with what you want to do. Otherwise, uh, he wouldn't be called time and time and time again by very different architects to join them and help them to, what's the word, materialize the idea. So when you want to materialize the idea, you realize that you need someone who is going to understand what you want to do and develop it further, precisely in the areas that you don't know and he knows. So that's the first thing that I think with, with Klaus is, is just a fantastic example that you will enjoy very much. But in addition to that, um, what I'd like to highlight is that his involvement in teaching is also a very specific and, how shall I say, um, at some stage, I don't know if it was journalism or that he actually said the word or whatever, but there is a, a, a heading of one of the interviews published in the uh, Specialized Press. He says, every project is a prototype. Well, that I think is, I can only be said by someone who's actually teaching because it's the core of it. You go to the, to the essence of it. Well, I normally complain of very long introductions, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Klaus is going to be showing us uh, with deeds what I've just said with words. Klaus, please. Thank you very much, Xavier, for that introduction. You, as you can explain our philosophy much better than we can do it ourselves. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I'm. Uh, I feel very honored to be here for I know this school, of course, since a long time. And I'm teaching at Angewandte in Vienna, so we have uh, some exchange with the school. And I, not only I, we admire the philosophy of the school very much. We have uh, also philosophy. I hope you would say a similar thing to <laughs> our school. But uh, no, this, uh, the concept here is, is great. So I would like to talk a bit uh, about developments in uh, structural design. That means the developments we did in the recent years in our office, uh, which are partly common developments. Others did it as well, but sometimes uh, we did it differently or we did it before. Uh, we, last year we had the uh, exhibition in the Deutsche Architekturmuseum in, in, in Frankfurt. And so uh, I started to think a bit back and I thought it's very important to see, to look a bit back uh, into the history, in, in, uh, in the history in total of course, but also what we did in the last years. And uh, where, are, where are we now? Where, did, uh, where was the point of uh, departure and what did we uh, do in between. Uh, and as you said, for us it's very important not to do only our structural work, but 
to be involved uh, in the design process uh, with many different architects with different philosophies but from uh, if possible from the beginning on and to develop uh, together with the architects the concept of the project for as you know uh, structure is not only a necessity structure is part of the architecture and structure can support the architecture a lot. So, so I will show, by showing the developments, I also will show you some project we did in the office. So the first, what you see here is the Ufa Kino in Dresden. Probably you know it, probably it's too old to know it for you. You have young people, young guys, so I know. Uh, Sometimes I think we are talking about the past. For us, it's not that long ago, but for you, it's something. <laughs> but this was, you, you uh, know, in Germany, uh, the architecture is very strict. And this was the first freeform building in Germany done by Kor Pimmelblau. And the goal of Kor of Korp uh, Himmelblau, especially Wolf Tricks now, is to deal with gravity. Yeah, to, uh, we know gravity exists, but you can deal with it. You can show structures which seemingly are floating, denying gravity, as Yves Klein does it here. So, and if we, I look back to these tools we had that time, we did the same we do now. I mean, in the end, I will show you a bit of the tools we have now, maybe you know them. Uh, but we did the same. So we, we created a computer model, a structural model, and we created here the geometric model, parallel in uh, physical model, parallel uh, in the computer and then we connected that by hand and proved it and developed it further by experimenting. And that's what we now implemented uh, in the computer programs. Another kind of freeform project is this Gary Museum in uh, Herford. It's quite different from that what Kopp Himmel Allowed us, but uh, for us this was a, a geometric uh, challenge, especially for we had to do the working plans and to uh, uh, to invent ways how this how the formwork could be done. In this case, it was uh, banded plywood. I like this very much. It could be seen for several years for uh, they had to look for a new, for fresh money. And so it uh, lasted some years and that's the finished building. So then we did a lot of uh, work in terms of free form when it started to, came up, to come up. So we did the with Bernhard Franken, I think the first bubble which really was built, it was a, a building for the BMW, a fair building in Frankfurt, and Bernhard Bubble created it by, he was the first one in, in Europe, I guess, who used Maya. So, uh, these are two water drops flowing uh, into, an, into each, each other and then he stopped the process and said this is the, the model, this is the computer model and this uh, we have to build. And we did it by creating uh, this aluminum skeleton and by bending uh, acrylic glass on milled 
mod. And then came the next bubble, uh, which was much bigger than this one. It was the Kunsthaus in Graz, maybe you know it, or I guess you know it, uh, with Peter Cook and Colin Fournier. And this was the, the model uh, for the uh, competition entry. A very nice model, but in the next step, we had to really to build it, so we started by uh, creating this Rhino mod model. I uh, forget to mention, we could build this uh, bubble, this BMW bubble, uh, uh, by uh, for, for uh, Rhino came up, came on the market, and we used the better version yeah, uh, for this uh, bubble, which was not so comfortable as it is today. But without Rhino, it would be impossible impossible to do that. And here you see the Rhino work, and then we implemented also in this structure the in in this surface the structure. So and this is the steel primary structure, and the outer surface then again is this uh, acrylic skin. Sorry, and this is the building a very, uh, Peter Cook, Peter called it the friendly alien and all the people in Graz now call it also friendly alien, they love it. So, and we also did a lot, a lot of work with Corp Himmelblau, is the, and Wolf Tricks especially. And if you go on uh, discussing gravity and uh, discussing what they, what Corp Himmelblau did in the 60s and 70s, so they did clouds. And we had a project and clouds that has something to do with, uh, with the dream of flying that means overcoming the laws of gravity, overcoming the closed system in which we have to live with the rigid rules. This was a project we did, uh, the sketch for a project. Uh, we uh, did uh, in uh, uh, Qatar. And Wolf wrote, Lieber Klaus, also dear Klaus, let the bird fly. Yeah, that's the dream. Or even whales want to overcome gravity, even if they float in the water. Yeah, that means to overcome a closed system. But uh, overcoming closed system always means that the authorities do not like that someone overcomes it. So you get punished if you handle, uh, if you go against the rules. So this was the cloud project. We started with this, uh, uh, pro uh, or I have to explain, uh, there was a project in Guadalajara for a very rich investor who wanted to build a new city and invited 10 very famous architects and Corp Himmelblau did uh, the cultural and uh, yeah, let's say the cultural center there was uh, theater, cinemas, uh, library and all these uh, buildings uh, have a common roof and in the first step we had this kind of roof, a very lightweight roof, and but was said that, that's not. Or we met in Guadalajara and drank tequila, and so it was very nice. And we have to design something else. So 
I ask Wolf, what do you want? What do you think about cloud? So, yes, cloud would be fine. So we started with the first cloud we did, and we did it, Corp Himmelblau always uh, builds physical models. Parallel, we did uh, with our uh, structural uh, tools, we tried to create a model, and we, in the end we succeeded by deforming a grid, and in the end, and then we cut the edges. So, and in the end, we had a, a cl it's not a, uh, not literally cloud, but a cloud-like roof. And for me, as, as a structural element uh, engineer, it was also was also important to have a certain height there where where we needed it for the bending moments, so we could realize a very very long spans and long cantilevers. So in the same, we went on with this cloud-like structures by creating a roof for the BMW, BMW uh, world in Munich. So the same procedure, we took another grid and a lower grid and deformed the other grid by using negative gravity and deformed the lower grid by using forces, virtual forces, which had something to do with the meanings of the space underneath. And then we connected both by diagonals and had a wonderful load-bearing structure, which is very efficient and very also easy to build. Everybody says, this is so expensive. Why can you do that? You make everything architects want, even if, it's, if the client can pay, pay for it. I said, no, it's not expensive. It's a very lightweight roof, and having it curved does it not make more expensive than having it straight. So, and this, in the same time, we started for the design, uh, with the design for the Musée de Confluence in Lyon, which also is a cloud like structure, but in this case, the museum space is inside this cloud, which means the structure is not a very lightweight roof structure. The structure is a real load-bearing structure, like this. And after a long time, I hopefully it will open this year. So this project is in is a conference center in Dalian. It's also a cloud-like structure, even if you don't see it, uh, uh, don't recognize it so easily. But uh, uh, there are parallels to the cloud-like structure. So all the structures are uplifted. We have the cores. We have. Uh, conference rooms, we have a theater for uh, opera for 1,800 uh, people, and, and all is uh, situated on this uplifted table you see in the second picture. And this is the construction work on site, wonderful steel structures. <coughs> they did it on a shipyard. It's a really huge building, even if it does not look like that. So that's the inside. And this is a small cloud, but I love it. Very small cloud, and Wolf loves it very much. Too. It's a, a church in Austria, in the hometown town of Wolf Brix. So it's built like a ship, and it's it's built by Ostsee Stahl, which is a sh shipyard in Germany. Yeah, with bended steel.
And now we are actually working on this project, which again is something uh, uh, cloud-like. It's a huge center for uh, uh, ice, snow, and what uh, was uh, It's a span of 300 meters, and it's in a pit, so we can build an arch-like arch -like table and an independent roof which goes down uh, in, uh, and creates this drop. But both the red structure and the blue structure are independent. And on the right-hand side, see, you see how we create the, the geometry of the structure by using the tools we have today, yeah? which is mainly a program we created in Vienna uh, named Caramba. Yeah. You know it? Yeah. Good. You use it? <laughs> Good. And this is ex example how, <coughs> yeah, for I say structure is not only a structure and you should not, should not only think in, in layers, there's the structural layer, the MEP layer, and so on and so else. And uh, our goal is to integrate as much as possible in one layer. So we did with Sana this project in Germany, in Essen. Maybe you have seen it, you know it. And there's a situation that they have a mine underneath and they pump warm water, which has 28 degrees. They pump it out of the mine and in the next, uh, in the next river and waste the, the heat. And then came up by Transolar came up the idea to use uh, this to heat the building. That means if we heat up the, uh, the walls and the slabs, we do not need insulation. So we have these tubes inside the walls and inside the slabs, as you see here. And that's it. That's the whole wall. Everything is inside the concrete. Everything is integrated. For Sana wanted uh, to have a pure concrete building, which looks inside as a concrete building and outside. And uh, that was the competition entry, but then we worked on it with them and said, we need some insulation somewhere. Yeah, that means uh, layer in, uh, concrete layer inside and insulation and then outside, which is very difficult if you have no joints. And they would never tolerate visible joints. And then we had a solution, and when we had it, after hard work, came up Transolar with that idea. Let's do it like that. <laughs> so that's all. It's very, yeah, reduced. You don't see window frames, yeah? Even the drainage of the sill is integrated in uh, concrete. And even the smoke exhausting ducts are integrated. That's it, so. That's the office space. So, and the next uh, step was when uh, was to introduce uh, parametric design, yeah, long before Grasshopper, or before Grasshopper existed. So, and we scripted some tools there for this project, which in the end then was not built. I, so only built project besides this one, which was a 
very pity. Uh, it was the Marinsky Theater with Dominique Perrault. Yeah, theater inside and the skin outside over the whole thing. And this uh, is a triangle skin with these elements inside and all elements are different but uh, uh, are similar but not same. So and here we created tools to deal with this uh, situation very uh, economically in terms of planning uh, costs. So this was the introduction of, for us of parametric design. And our next step was to let the computer uh, create structures itself. And it started with this project, again with Dominique Perrault, it's in uh, Naples, the, 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 on the Piazza Garibaldi. It's a new mall underneath the plaza level uh, and it's built not only as a mall but as a, uh, access to the metro, new metro station. And as a connection from, uh, from the underground to the plaza, uh, we worked on, uh, together with uh, Dominic wanted to design this roof. And so we, we talked about, as this was, the, was his first approach and then we, in the design process, we talked about uh, computer generated uh, structures. And we tried to create a triangle folded structure and if you go for folded structure, you can look in uh, some books, for example, Engel, and take one of all these examples and then uh, out of the box. But we wanted to do it differently by using the computer. For the computer can do it better than an engineer and architect can do it by hand. That was our goal. We did not know if it works, but it should, it should work. So we let the, and the way how it works, we wanted to create a, a load-bearing structure by pulling points up and down, uh, the joints, up, knots up and down. And not in, and there is a method, uh, gener, uh, generative, the evolutionary process, which was known that time, but not in, not used for developing the structures. And the process is like in the nature, we, we, we create a random uh, generation and then evaluate this generation, for example, by <coughs> looking for the deflections and take the best and combine the best with the next best and uh, to accelerate the process, you can introduce mutations, even as it happens in nature, and so on. Yeah, and on the left-hand side, you see the generations with the behavior which is not so good, and it gets better and better. And for me, it's very, int and, and then it, uh, it, it stays on a certain level. And for me, it's very uh, interesting that all individuals are good. You can't say which is the best. Also, we are all good, as we are. I mean, yeah? all the, there is no optimum, no real optimum. There are no good. There are only good solutions. But in this case, we did not. Uh, Dominic did not like the design, so he wanted to have it more uh, biologically. Uh, so and then we did it. This way, we did. We created again in the, uh, with the computer by using the hanging model, as Gaudi did it, but in the computer, and created these tree-like elements. So it's nearly finished now. So and 
then we use this in several cases and for example in this structure which is built at the airport in Frankfurt. So we let, we create, that the computer can create uh, trust structures by organizing these, the, these dial, uh, diagonals by itself. So what we, we are experimenting on, uh, um, on the question of, uh, or thinking about the question, uh, what is order, what is disorder, how many order or disorder do we need? And to introduce a bit of order in a disorder, I say we need order or ordered chaos or chaotic order. So, and to, uh, to mix order and disorder, we introduced this U-shaped elements, yeah? So, to, to create a bit of order behind. So, and that's the result. The first build, purely computer designed uh, bridge. Yeah? What I mentioned, I think it's important to have a a certain amount of disorder for we are curious. We are all are curious and we want to be surprised and we do not want to see only regular things. We want to be uh, irritated. Yeah? It's, I'm convinced that it's important. Not for everybody, but I, I like it. Um, and now we can do with the computer what our uh, ancestors uh, did 200, 300 years ago. Yeah, for they did not calculate the bridges, uh, the structures. They did it somehow, uh, craftsman-like, for example. And I like this bridge. The Walton Bridge, I like it very much. So, for uh, you, just here you have this uh, uh, ordered chaos and order. Yeah. And we go on to bring it back in this uh, computer-generated structure, but we are not sure how many order we need. But we are now experimenting on a kind of order by laying fields behind or something like that, yeah? And then the outcome, for example, is our structures like that. Another example where we use this computer gener generation is a sculpture in the Deutschen Bank, in the refurbished Deutschen Bank in Frankfurt done by Mario Bellini. This was his design and then I got involved and he said, I'm so unhappy, I always see these decorative things. And then I told him, maybe we should think about the computer or should, uh, if the computer could help to get this decoration uh, manner out of it. So, and then we, we started to let the computer create these rings. Uh, and to generate it. And uh, one fitness criteria was to, was the distribution of the rings. They should not be quite regular, but not that irregular as here. So you can just, and there are bridges going through it. This space has to be kept free, be kept free. And at least it, at last it had to be a load bearing structure. It does not look like a load-bearing structure, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it has to uh, bear his, its own weight, which is not that, uh, which is a lot. So, and again, this generative process, and that's the outcome in the end. So, and 
uh, we also did what's called Himmelblau, the European Central Bank, and there we have two, uh, two towers, and the towers are for the bracing. One tower could not stand alone. It could, but uh, the deflection would be too high. So we connected it by a kind of truss, and we wanted not to have a regular truss. This would not fit to the architecture of Korb Himmelblau, so, or to the architecture of this tower. So again, we let a computer create this truss, and we let it, we created several versions, and in the end, it, uh, so we trimmed the computer back to this uh, regular irregularity, so and the outcome was then the system on the right hand side. Yeah, so we have the two cores connected by the, the diagonals and this creates a kind of vertical truss. So the building is, will be open this year, hopefully. So then in the, a big challenge for us was the work with Sana in Lausanne. Uh, they won the competition for a learning center for the University of Lausanne, the EPFL, the Technical University, EPF, yeah. And their concept was, I always say, it's a mixture of uh, Mies, the pavilion, and uh, Corbusier, or uh, and Niemeyer, so with the curved surfaces. And they created it by treating it like a carpet by lifting it, it up. That, but it meant for us to have a kind of uh, foundation slab with a free span of 80 meters. And as you know, the problem of an arch is the buckling. So, and then we did a lot of research work a long time for, this was never built, a such flat arch-like structure. So we followed then the principal membrane forces and reinforced along these lines uh, the concrete slab. We also uh, looked for steel structures, but in the end we, uh, we decided to have a, that the best is a pure concrete structure for Sana did not want to see any cladding, and if you have a cladded steel structure, you always will see it. So they wanted to have it pure. And even in terms of building, it was the cheapest and the most efficient kind. So we had a, a, a 60 centimeters thick slab with some reinforced uh, areas where they, uh, uh, which are 80 centimeters thick. And these arch-like structures are bent together by, as you see there, by uh, pre-stressed cables in the slab underneath. And the next challenge was how to build it, how to do the form work. So and it's rather easily done by, by creating these CNC cut uh, spanten, also elements, and, the, and covered by a pre band uh, MDF, play, uh, not, not plywood, but you know what I mean. And this is other plans for the preparation of the CNC cut uh, things. Yeah, so it's a very smooth surface. 
but we had a lot of reinforcement. <laughs> it was a wonderful sight. I kind of love it. So, so and this is the finished shell. Yeah, again, it's it's floating. It has something again something to do with gravity to deny gravity. And the uh, pavilion on top of it should be, as Sana wanted to have it, very simple, as simple as possible. As I heard that the students love it, really. So, and then we were forced to build the largest cantilever in the world. So, uh, Corp Himmelblau won, won this competition in Busan for a Busan Cinema Center. Uh, they have the Asian uh, film festival there and they needed a, f a festival center. And they wanted to have a very spectacular one. The mayor wanted to have it. So we did in the competition, uh, cantilevering roof, which cantilevers 80, uh, 90 meters without columns underneath. We proved that it works, but knew in our mind that, or kept in our mind that nobody would pay for it in the end. So we, uh, in the first presentation, we proposed it with some column-like elements there, very thin and very nice. And, so, and the mayor said, you promised me a cantilevering roof, the largest cantilevering roof in the world. Please do it. Okay, then we do it, <laughs> if you pay for it. <coughs> so what, uh, in the, the, the cinema center is in the background. There is a huge, send, a huge cinema building on the left-hand side with several uh, cinemas and the theater. On the right-hand side, behind us, you don't see it, is a open-air cinema. And this cantilevering roof is a kind of uh, semi-public uh, space, covered semi-public space, which for Wolf Briggs always is very important to create public space. Yeah, if you have, even if you have a private investor, you should create public space as this. So, and that's again how we did it. Yeah, it's again uh, kind of these clouds we built together. Yeah, a lower grid, an upper grid, and diagonals between and then this double cone. So, of course, we proved everything very carefully. That's how they built it. The cantilevering part they built uh, on the ground and then lifted it up. Here they lift. So there's nothing, it's only roof, no columns. So it's and there are ramps and bridges hanging down from the, suspended down from the roof. And this is the roof for the open air cinema, so called small roof. That's the night version of the roof. So a new step for us also was uh, this project was uh, had it, the Hungerburgbahn of Unicola Railway in Innsbruck with uh, four stations and we did this, these stations and uh, what we did before in building these bubbles as you saw we used acrylic. But acrylic has, if you want to have a waterproof structure, it's a bit difficult to using acrylic for acrylic has, uh, uh, the, the joints are not uh, dauerhaft, uh, they have to be repaired. 
every every spring or every year. So that's why uh, we thought about using glass in that case. But bending glass, it's much more difficult to bend uh, instead bending uh, acrylic. So we have these four stations with different shapes. The shapes all have to do with the, the, the movement of the people under, underneath. So first we had to create a stiff structure inside. For it has to be a load-bearing structure. There are only, only very few, sometimes three, sometimes four support joints. That's the structure inside. And then we had to create this uh, glass skin or design this glass skin. This, that's the paneling of it. So and uh, it was planned that an Austrian, Austrian uh, manufacturer should deliver this glass. But then he got a new owner and this owner said that's too risky, please don't do it. And so the plan, plan B was to go to China. It was prepared by the manufacturer. But uh, you see how they do it there. It's not CNC, uh, CNC milled mold, it's a handmade mold. So that it was very difficult to get then uh, to, to, to get further results. That's why the contractor, uh, the company Parkets, gave them a 3, 3D scanner and forced them only to ship the elements if they are within a tolerance of five millimeters, but they shipped it sometimes, however, and then we had these joints. And the, uh, the critics and Hinde has the, the, the journalists said, oh, that's, that's uh, not okay, you have these joints and so on. But now uh, everything is, that in the end, um, they change the elements. So then we had, uh, had to solve the question how to fix the panels to the metal structure for there are, uh, there's a whole range of angles possible and we did uh, a, a lot of as you see here we tried a lot of uh, mechanical uh, solutions but then in the end we saw that a low-tech version would be the most easiest which looks like that. It's just a milled uh, plastic form. That's it. And the panels can be s easily screwed into this. So that's the result. So the next step for us was when Grasshopper came up, so that again changed our working process. And the first project where we used this, this was the better, we used the better version of Grasshopper, um, was this uh, stadium in Gdansk, together with RKW architects in Germany. And their design idea was to create a, oh, I forgot what the name is, Bernstein, Bernstein. In Danzig they have this, you know, this, uh, N no, no, this, okay, okay, it was, that's, <laughs> okay, this was the design, a, a kind of, of huge basket, which is a spatial structure which, uh, where everything works together. It's a kind of, of grid shell with reinforced, uh, uh, with reinforcing girders. Now, this should be a film, but 
does not work. So, and with, uh, with Grasshopper, uh, or back to this, all parts are similar, but not the same, not the same. And using Grasshopper, we could uh, design one and change one and change the whole system very directly. So uh, the polish fees are not very high, but it was enough for us and by using Grasshopper. Yeah, we So another challenge which, which was very special for us was this project was uh, SANA, uh, the Louvre in Laws. It should be the most reduced building which is ever possible. And even the structure should be so reduced that it's not visible as a structure, if possible. And this was the competition. And here you see the facade, that was the goal. Yeah, that the facade is, uh, it's uh, aluminum, it's, uh, it's uh, not uh, so semi-shiny and even inside there's the same aluminum. It's a very special atmosphere there yeah. inside. So, and what you see here is, uh, is the structure which should not look like a structure. We have just lamellas, also vertical plates uh, as a kind of lamellas, which also could, be, uh, could have something to do with shading. And that's it. But as you know, the the buckling of this structure is uh, the most important thing to solve. And we did it by looking for the, what, what, do we ha what else do we have for the glass structure? Or, or what do we need for the, uh, for the glass as a secondary structure? And we used everything and to create some kind of uh, Fiendale frame. The easiest way could have been to have uh, reinforcement, uh, to have bracings there, crossed elements. But this is totally forbidden in that case. That's, if, you <laughs> yeah, if you do not know anything what to do, you can do, you, you, you normally do these uh, crosses. So. But the challenge is to avoid them, to replace them by something else. Yeah, this is the foyer. Of course, the columns are needed, but the columns should be as thin as possible, as you see here. So, uh, then we had a project with Dominique Perrault, and Dominique Perrault wanted to have this very slender high rise. So we did many, many versions of, of structure. In the end, came up this. What? Yeah, the slenderness is uh, the core slenderness one to twenty-five, and the slenderness of the outer columns to height is one to eleven. And if you are asked what is the height of a cantilever, yeah, you can say it's maximum one to ten. Slimmer is usually not possible. And uh, a high rise is nothing else than a vertical cantilever. Yeah, and the slimmest high rises are one to ten now. And so, but we had to solve this, and we did it by introducing introducing uh, these cantilevers and combining it with. lower part uh, uh, 
uh, what did I say, cantilever, uh, by introducing these outriggers. You know, outrigger is the connection between the core and the outer columns. So normally the core is, the inner core is bracing the building. And that's what we then did by introducing these very, first we had diagonals, but the MEP guys said, we don't want to have these diagonals, we need the space free. So we introduced <coughs> this, these thick concrete slabs. Concrete slabs, as you see here. And these reinforcing walls to the foundation slab and but however uh, this uh, in, in terms of stability it's okay so but in terms of accelerations uh, it's still a problem for their is residential in the uh, in the uh, top of the building and in Europe it's the ex uh, uh, the accelerations are restricted, not in the States. So we, so we choose a, a damper, an additional damper to reduce the acceleration. Yeah, the damper is a pendulum which is uh, filled, uh, consists on, uh, out of steel and is filled with water. These are the steel plates. So that's the foundation slab. That's this um, the cantilevering slabs. Yeah, one facade is like flowing water. This is, and that's how it is. But how it is now. But it, uh, the design only works as a double tower. Yeah, for the they are standing face to face and one tower, one tower does not make really the design of the uh, sense but this, the next should come but nobody knows when. So another kind of shell we did now using uh, again grasshopper is this museum the roof of a museum in Frankfurt with Schneider and Schumacher, the Städel Museum, so called. So they won the competition by uh, creating a space underneath the garden instead of having something in the garden. And together with them in the competition, we created this. Uh, shell-like structure here by using ANSYS. You know ANSYS maybe? Mm -hmm. And so we, what we did is the same as uh, Isla did by creating the hanging models. But now we do not, know the, uh, do not need the physical models. We can do it in a computer. So we had this and then we did the geometric work together with the architects. The geometric work then was to create these openings. They are all different but similar. And of course, this is uh, perfect for grasshopper. And we use grasshopper until the end. Uh, we did also the whole the working plans with grasshopper. Even the reinforcement we did was grasshopper. Yeah, even the post-tensioning cables which are in it, we, uh, we, we uh, designed, we, we drew with grasshopper. It's 
again an integrated structure. Everything is in the concrete. That's a, yeah, it looks like a, like a cloud like thing again, yeah. So the difference, if you see that, so there was a discussion, should we paint it or not? Yeah, here you see it's a concrete structure, it's uh, heavy, uh, not a lightweight structure and what is it? And this is a, it's nothing. So I go forward a little bit. So then we introduced uh, uh, building inform information modeling the first time for this project with Corp Himmelblau. It's a museum in Shenzhen. The concept is we have these three of these, we have two museums, uh, urban uh, planning museum and an art museum. And they consist on this uh, four meter high s steel slabs, which are only supported by, the, by these cores and where all the technical MEP things then are inside the slabs and on the slabs is the ex exhibition space. But there are no further columns. And the whole building then is covered by the skin. So, and then, we used the digital project to, together with the architects. It was a kind of experiment to sit together in one room, architects and engineers, and work on the same uh, model. And it was quite successful. So now we go on, but uh, now using the set of course, but now we use Revit and especially Revit, not longer digital project. We also do facade planning here with the, in a project with Juan Sopiano. It's a high rise in, in Seoul for the Korean telecom. We do the structure and we do the, yeah, this, the structure is a steel structure with concrete cores. But we have a very, for Korean conditions, a very special uh, created a very special facade which should be uh, very reduced with minimal elements and it's a, a double layered structure. Yeah, you see the, the connection between the outer and the inner elements is only this uh, this casted element there. So and then we did the experiment. This, we, we are working on, uh, or we are thinking that the computer in future will uh, be able to create more without much influence by, uh, by the user. So we are experiments about uh, could a computer create space as well, not only structure but also space. And this we did with lava in a competition. We gave the computer, uh, so we told the computer where we would, sh where we should a higher density, where we wanted to have a higher density and where a lower density, and then gave the computer a set of elements. Yeah, these elements, and the computer should combine it. And the same way, the evolutionary process, as I explained it, yeah, with all uh, with the evaluation of all these fitness criteria, yeah, the load behavior, behavior, also the program, the load bearing behavior, and uh, so on. And uh, there was a usable outcome, really. 
it was a kind of experiment and we'll go on this way, but this was, was the first step. So, and now you know Kalamba, you told me. So meanwhile, um, well, what we did in the past was we had the geometric mot uh, model, especially in Rhino, and then uh, yeah, we gave the data back and forth to the structure uh, program and uh, ru to run through all this uh, geo uh, generative process, which takes a lot of time. Not a lot of time, but it takes time. And what we have now, we have it in one, both in one program and get the results nearly immediately. Yeah, in real time. So as you, if you used it, you see you can create geometry and you see on the other screen in real time the load uh, bearing behavior. Or you, so that's one thing. So you can uh, create structures, geometry and structures very quickly. Or you can use Caramba in, if you combine it uh, with Galapagos to, uh, to create all these computer generated structures we did by the scripted tools before. So, this is an example where we used Caramba uh, building those Fallgeist artifacts in, uh, in Vienna. It's a building in Liechtenstein. So, here we started. Uh, or we, we started the normal way, so the architect had his uh, uh, the, dif the different floor plans and uh, then we started to look for where can columns be, where can columns go through and it was very difficult for all floor plans were different. So I said, why must columns go through? So we learned that they should go through. But if it, the columns don't go straight through, if the columns are kind of V-shaped or A-shaped, so they can be confined to kind of tree-like structures, but uh, the computer could do it better than we can do it, so we let the computer, these are the columns, and we gave the computer the space where no columns should be, and where columns could be. So, and then the computer created an efficient load bearing system. So, that's the outcome. That's uh, the 3D model uh, done with Revit. So, we did the whole building then in the end uh, in Revit. So, in the last example, where we used Caramba, the SOMA architects asked, so we have an idea of so only having these sticks and how can they create a load bearing structure? I said, no, let the computer do it, you will get it. And so, going through this process, we got in the end this structure. And then this pavilion with a membrane uh, inside. And that's it. If so Brett, Brett asked me, no, I have to tell. I, I can shortly go through for through these pictures for when Brett invited me, he asked me, so you did this Tatlin seminar in, at, the, at the Angewande. Uh, couldn't you talk about it? But maybe it's a bit late. It's not, <coughs> no. So we did several seminars in, or we, in, in at the Angewande where we, um, uh, we do a research about buildings which are very important for the architectural history, but never have been built.
for it, the first one was the Tatlin Tower, where everybody said this never could be never built. It was an illusion to build that. So, and the task for the student was proof that it could be can be built, could be built that time, or say it could never be built. So, uh, I just as an introduction for the construction about you all know that, yeah, I do not, but maybe you do not know that. I love that very much. Uh, this is Karl Jokansson, sorry, the N is missing. Uh, he disappeared in the his history, yeah, but he obviously he did these first tensor credit structures. Yeah, not Buckminster Fuller. Then we have Elisitsky versus Brown, and yeah, this again is a, a kind of uh, denying gravity. This too. We also did a seminar about uh, this uh, Wolkenbügel. Yeah, rebuild the Wolkenbügel and show how it had, uh, how, how it could be built. Was the task. And, and this is an article about the Wolkenbügel from uh, a translation, obviously, from Isvestia uh, Asnova from 1926. And but I think you should read that, please. That's what Lisitsky wrote that time. Isn't it great? He described how we build today. Yeah? And shouldn't you students today describe how we build in whatever, many how many decades? Yeah, and then we have Tatlin with that tower for uh, the third, the third, the third, the third international. So you see the height. It was. It, it should be higher than the Eiffel Turm, of course. But it's not only a tower. Inside there are rooms which are not, which is very important, uh, uh, which always move. Everything is uh, is moving. Yeah, this is a very important metaphor. Also, the spiral is a very important metaphor for movement. And. So the student proved that it students proved that it could have been built. They used the structural tools, and yeah, this is the comparison. And uh, the weight of the steel would have been about 120,000 tons, which is a lot, but. Uh, since we had this bird's nest, I always say it's one bird's nest, two bird's nest, three bird's nest. One bird's nest is 40,000 uh, kilo uh, tons. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then of, we all know Stalin came and this was the new kind of architecture. And Tatlin did other things, for example, creating uh, this kind of air pipe, his, uh, he said everybody should have a cis individual, individual uh, air pipe and fly around with it. And, and he really worked on it, but uh, it has to, the work has to be continued, I would say. Thank you. If there are any uh, questions, we could keep them uh, uh, you know, short and to the point, perhaps two or three. Is there any questions around?
Anybody wants to? Um, so when you set up, let's say, so okay, you make maybe a parametric model or you work on the structure, you know, together, let's say, with the architect. What is then the involvement, for example, on the fitness criteria? Because we have on one side, you know, trying to get, let's say, the structure right. And on the other side, we have, because we have this, um, how did you say it? We have all these kind of possibilities that all are right kind of architecturally. Is it then um, that the architects just choose or do you already, let's say, embed um, architectural mm -hmm. definitions in what the fitness landscape is? Or is it back and forward or do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Uh, sorry. It, it's still a kind of research process we are in mm -hmm. now. And this is very important to bring all these things into the process, what you say now. And we are working on it now. For example, we are working on a tool uh, at the university. I, I, we, we get money from the government for it, as a Forschungsprojekt, a research project, which is paid. Um, where you can uh, get a m much more differentiated uh, evolutionary process and you see the results in between yeah, and you can uh, influence the process mm. which in the real evolution would uh, mean to be God. Yeah? Yeah, and this, uh, uh, that's very interesting, but we are not I in the I find it now, fascinating yeah? as well, and that comes back as w again to, you know, putting order in the chaos or, you know, what is it? Because even if we see, you know, we can now optimize or generate kind of all the solutions, but, you know, in the end, I mean, we don't actually want to have all the sol solutions in front of us because how can we choose? And, you know, what are now kind of driving kind of parameters or the you know, how can we combine, let's say, to still find some order or some meaning or whatever that is in it, in it and in which part do we actually control that? Yeah, I find it also really interesting. Yeah. yeah, also I have to say I'm not sure if this is the way we, uh, mm. f we will go uh, in the future. But uh, for me it's still an experiment and I think uh, anyone will come up with some tool which will create some uh, structure or, or architecture automatically. Uh, so it will come. But for me, it's still an experiment and we are, and it's a research project. Yeah. And it's a very fascinating uh, mm. uh, process now. And all what you say has to be brought into this process. I think looking at the, um, the sort of stories and the projects and particularly the technology driving them that you've presented throughout shows that, as, as you alluded to at the start, perhaps you've been pushing ahead of everyone else throughout um, and hitting these sort of tools and methods first. What, what do you think it is that means that you've taken this leap? I mean, soft, developing something like Karamba when a lot of other practices are still behind doing loops in and out of other software. What is it that, you, what sort of made you think that was the way to go, right, we're going to just develop our own and invest in doing that into what is obviously now a really quite um, developed tool that you've now released? I mean, Sorry, I but I, I, I did not get it. Uh, what, really. what is it about the, is it your own excitement with these, with these methods that mean you've, decided to develop them ahead of a lot of other practices who are sort of back still where you were potentially a few years ago. There's a lot of investment. Uh, yeah, we, ex we are excited about it, but we also had the people who are excited about it and they wanted to do it. Yeah? And we always, from the beginning on, when we started, was the first freeform thing, so we had people who were very keen to go that way. And this is important. For I can't do it, but I can be excited <laughs> and I can support it. Also I, I can't do it, you know, I'm not uh, so in that, uh, in, 
the tools. Hello. Uh, sorry. Um, you've uh, you presented something about BIM, and you also presented uh, something else relating to genetic algorithms. Um, in, is, have you built yet a connection between BIM, let's say, um, generating routes for services and combining it with, uh, you know, something for structures, um, clash detecting and then running it through again? Um, or is that, is it at the moment something entirely separate? Um, it's still, that's future, but it will come. That would be a goal, to combine the self-generated structures with the uh, with BIM, but then yeah, I, I we have a great be, tool. Yeah, sure. Would be uh, would we, it would be probably very very heavy, uh, but uh, I think sort of combining the, the structure and, um, and Maybe. services might be uh, of course. Um, I'm not sure if if it's too complex the for the computer for the computer not, but to uh, to program it and to handle it. Could, could be that it's too complex, but if you see other complex uh, programs, why not? Also, in, in, uh, we in architecture and building in general, we are quite behind other uh, uh, yeah, disciplines, yeah, other industries. Yeah. I was just thinking about the trusses you were showing before with, the, I think it was a Kof um structure slabs and you had a series of holes, let's say, through penetrations for, for services and uh, perhaps something like that could be... Um, no, what we do, in a, that, that's what, what we now combine. Also if we, uh, but that's the last phase of the design phase. Yeah. Yeah? Then we combine all the services, MEP versus structure and the architecture and so on. Yeah. But uh, to combine it in the early process, that's... Uh, but with potentially uh, add value to, to the project at, at a very early, more value at an early stage rather than, than um, arriving at no, the if, if you, then just you can optimizing it on a small scale. But you may, maybe you mean uh, if it could be combined by, uh, by drawing it, <coughs> then I'm convinced that it could be combined very early. But if you're talking about tools which generate the structure, yeah. the MEP, their cells. So then it's future, but maybe it will be, it will come soon. Perhaps we can, we can thank Klaus the usual way, uh, with a round of applause, and hope that he comes more often. Thank you.